Hello guys, uh, in this video let's discuss deglutation. So what is it that we are going to learn? We will understand the definition of deglutation, the phases of deglutation and few disorders of deglutation. So what is the definition of deglutation? Deglutation is a process by which the food which is present in the oral cavity passes into the stomach. As simple as that. So what are the different phases of deglutation? There are three phases of deglutation. There is a oral phase. In the oral phase what is happening? The food from the oral cavity is entering into the oropharynx and this is a voluntary phase. Next we have a pharyngeal phase wherein the food from the pharynx is entering into the esophagus and this is an involuntary phase. Third is what is called as the esophageal phase in which the food from the esophagus is entering into the stomach. Even this phase is also involuntary phase. So let's understand each of these phases one by one. So first is which phase? The first phase is what is called as the oral phase that is depicted in this first diagram. So after the process of mastication, the food is converted into the bolus and this food is placed on the dorsum of the tongue. This is the first point which you are supposed to write in your examinations. Second point is that now the tongue is pushing backwards and upwards against the palate. So when tongue pushes backwards and upwards against the palate, what is going to happen to the bolus? The bolus from the oral cavity is going to enter into the pharynx. This is the oral phase of deglutition. Very simple. Next, let's understand the pharyngeal phase of deglutition. This is little complicated. Now, where is the bolus? Now, the bolus has entered into the pharynx. So, as soon as the bolus enters into the pharynx, this bolus is going to cause stimulation of the receptors which are present in the pharynx. Okay, And the afferent impulses from these receptors is carried to a center. So what are the nerves which are carrying these afferent impulses? There are three nerves. The trigeminal nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. Now where is the center located? The center is called as the deglutation center and this is located in medulla oblongata, basically in the medulla oblongata. Now where exactly in the medulla oblongata is the deglutation center located? It is located in these two areas. One is called as nucleus tractus solitarius. Another one is called as the nucleus ambiguous. Now the efferent nerves arising from this center they are going to supply the various muscles of the palate, pharynx as well as the tongue. Now what are these efferent nerves? The efferent nerves are also the trigeminal nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve and also the hypoglossal nerve. So what is deglutation here? The deglutation is basically a reflex which is having the receptors which are present in the pharynx which is having the afferent impulses which are carried by the afferent nerve which is having the center which is located in the medulla oblongata and which is also having the efferents. Okay. Now there are very important events which occur in the pharyngeal phase of deglutition. Let's understand what all are those events which are going to occur. The first and foremost thing is that the soft palate is pulled upwards. Here you are seeing the soft palate is down. Okay. And here there is an opening which is present between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. During the time of the pharyngeal phase of deglutition, this soft palate is pulled up. So when the soft palate is pulled up, what do this soft palate do? It is going to shut off or shut down. Shut off is a better word. The oropharynx completely from the nasopharynx. So what is the use of this? The use of this is that whatever food is present in the oropharynx that is going to remain in the oropharynx and this is going to prevent the regurgitation of the food from the oropharynx into the nasopharynx. First point. What is the first point? The soft palate is pulled upwards. 
Second point is which I cannot explain you here in the diagram. There are folds in the pharynx which are called as palatopharyngeal folds. Now these palatopharyngeal folds they are pulled medially. Now when this palatopharyngeal folds are pulled medially it helps in the creation of what is called as a sagittal slit like structure. Now what is the importance of this sagittal slit like structure is that this sagittal slit like structure it is going to only allow properly masticated food to pass through. So it is having what is called as a selective action. The food which is not properly masticated is not going to enter. Only the properly masticated food is going to up, enter. So this is the second point. The third point is that the larynx is also pulled upwards and anteriorly because of the actions of the anterior muscles of the neck. So when the larynx is pulled anteriorly as well as upwards, what will this help in? This help in opening of the esophageal passage. Why is this important? This is important because the bolus of the foot can enter easily into the esophagus. So this is the third point. The fourth point is that what are these? These are the ocal cords which you are seeing here. And here in this diagram, we can see that the ocal cords are open. Whereas in the pharyngeal phase here, you can see that the ocal cords are tightly approximated. So when the ocal cords are tightly approximated, what will it help in? It will help in prevention of the food pot particles to enter into the trachea. This is the fourth point. Next point is that here we can see in this diagram again, that the epiglottis is up. Now what is happening here in this diagram? In this diagram we can see, so what is happening here in this diagram? In this diagram we can see that the epiglottis has swung back and it has closed the laryngeal inlet. So what is this helping? This is also helping in prevention of food particles to enter into the larynx. So both the closure of the trachea as well as the swinging back of the epiglottis so as to close the laryngeal inlet is going to stop the breathing for some time. This is called as deglutational apnea. What is it called? It is called as deglutational apnea. Now, all these things we are going to push the bolus down. So when the bolus goes down and it just going to touch the upper end of the esophagus, what is going to happen? What are these? What is this structure? This is called as upper esophageal sphincter. Now, what is the state of the upper esophageal sphincter here? The upper esophageal sphincter is closed. Now, when the bolus is reaching towards the upper end of the esophagus, what is happening to the upper esophageal sphincter? The upper esophageal sphincter, which is a tonically constricted structure, it is going to relax. So, it is going to relax. Next point is that, as I have told you regarding this reflex which is called as the deglutational reflex because of which there is going to be contraction of the muscles of the pharynx. Now the contraction of the muscles of the pharynx is going to create a peristaltic wave in the pharynx. This peristaltic wave is extremely important to push this food down into the esophagus. Now as soon as the food is pushed into the esophagus what has happened to the upper esophageal sphincter? The upper esophageal sphincter has again closed or it has constricted. So what is the help of this? The help of this or the function of this is that it is again helping in preventing the food which has entered into the esophagus so that it is not going to come back into the oropharynx. So it is preventing the regurgitation of the food. So let's revise all these points which we have studied. So what was the first thing that I told you? The soft palate is pulled upwards because of which the oropharynx is completely shut down from the nasopharynx. So this was the first point. So what's the function of this? It is going to prevent the regurgitation of the food from the oropharynx into the nasopharynx. Second point is the palatopharyngeal folds are pulled medially. This creates a sagittal slit like opening because of which only properly masticated food is going to pass through. Third point is that the larynx is pulled up and anteriorly. This is going to enlarge the opening of the esophagus. Fourth point, approximation of the ocal cords. 
Fifth point, epiglot is closes the laryngeal opening by swinging back and closing the laryngeal inlet. Both of these are going to prevent the food to enter into the laryngeal inlet as well as into the trachea. And this is going to cause what is called as deglutational apnea. Now, by this time, the bolus of food has reached the upper end of the esophagus. So, what is going to happen? There is going to be relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter. Now, the pharyngeal muscles, they begin to contract. That causes a peristaltic wave in the pharynx. This is going to push the bolus into the esophagus. So, this is how you are supposed to write your answer for the pharyngeal phase. Now, where is the food? Now, the food has entered where? The food has entered into the esophagus. Already, there is a peristaltic wave which is there in the pharynx. Now, this peristaltic wave in the pharynx, it is going to continue in the esophagus and this peristaltic wave, which is a continuation of the pharyngeal peristaltic wave is what is called as the primary peristalsis. Now, this primary peristaltic wave from the upper end of the esophagus is going to come down to the lower end of the esophagus. So, when this primary peristaltic wave reaches the lower end of the esophagus, it, it leads to opening of one more sphincter which is called as the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, opening of the lower esophageal sphincter is going to move the food particles from the esophagus into the stomach. Remember that the primary peristaltic wave is basically under the control of the vagus nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve as well as the deglutational center. Now, let's say the primary peristaltic wave was unable to move the food particles from the esophagus into the stomach. So, that means still there are a lot of food particles which are remaining in the esophagus. Now, these food particles, they are going to stimulate the mechanoreceptors which are present in the wall of the esophagus. Okay. And this is going to create one more wave of peristalsis, which is called as the secondary peristalsis. Remember that secondary peristalsis is not a continuation of the peristaltic wave, which had originated at the level of the pharynx. This is coming from the esophagus itself. And what did I tell you regarding the primary peristaltic wave? That the primary peristaltic wave is under the control of vagus glossopharyngeal nerve as well as, it, as well as the deglutational center. But remember that the secondary peristaltic wave is under the control of intrinsic nerves which are present in the wall of the esophagus like our myenteric plexus. So now the secondary peristalsis, what's its function? whatever food particle is remaining back in the esophagus that it is going to push back into the stomach. So, here ends our third phase of deglutation. Let us understand few of the disorders of deglutation. It is always good to write the applied aspect when this question is asked. Just remember few things. What is the meaning of the word dysphagia? Dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing. What is the meaning of the word odinophagia? Odinophagia means what? Painful swallowing. What is reflex esophagitis? Just now I told you that there are two sphincters for the esophagus. One is an upper, another one is a lower. The lower esophageal sphincter, if it becomes very lax, what is going to happen is the contents of the stomach, which are highly acidic, they are going to enter into the lower end of the esophagus. Now, when this occurs constantly, it is going to cause inflammation of the mucosa of the lower end of the esophagus, which is called as reflux esophagitis. Next, we have one more entity, which is called as Barrett's esophagus, which is a consequence of reflex esophagitis. When repeatedly there is reflex esophagitis, what does it do is, it is going to change the structure of the epithelium which is present in the lower end of the esophagus. So, whenever the epithelial change occurs, that is what is called as metaplasia. Okay, that is called as metaplasia. And remember that Barrett's esophagus is also a precancerous condition. Next, we have a very important uh, uh, disorder of the esophagus which is called as Aclasia cardia. So, what happens in Aclasia cardia is that the lower esophageal sphincter and also the lower parts of the esophagus they fail to relax when the peristaltic wave comes down or when the foot bolus has come down. Now, why does this occur? This occurs because of lack of cells which are called as the ganglion cells. 
These ganglion cells are inhibitory cells and they release two very important substances. One is called as the vasoactive intestinal peptide. Another one is called as the nitric oxide. Both this VIP and nitric oxide, they are smooth muscle relaxants. So when there is no VIP and there is no nitric oxide in the nerve plexus, the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter is not going to occur. So now what is going to occur? The food is going to get stuck in the esophagus. So the upper parts of the esophagus, they go on becoming larger and larger. Okay. Whereas the lower part of the esophagus is very much a narrowed structure. One very important diagnostic test which we do in case of aclasia cardio or esophageal aclasia is what is called as a barium meal. And when we do this barium meal, we see that the lower part of the esophagus here you are seeing it is showing this structure and this is what is called as the bird beak appearance. This is called as the bird beak appearance whereas the upper part of the esophagus is expanded. So these are few of the disorders of the deglutition. I hope this video will be very helpful for you in your examination. If that's the case, do hit the like button. Do share this video as much as possible and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.